be live, and uh, we are live. And welcome to the the uh, listening party webinar with John Egan from the Desperation Band and New Life Church. My name is Ryan Dahl, and I'm uh, from the Praise Charts team. And we are so excited to be able to uh, to offer this kind of backstage pass to the the whole you know. The whole process that went behind this new album that came out from the Desperation Band called Center of It All. So, John, welcome to our little webinar here. And we got a number of people who are listening in. So, why don't you say hi and tell us, like, tell us exactly where you are, what's surrounding you, what room are you in? We want to get a picture of like your environment right now, just to <laughs> let us in. Well, thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, everyone, so much for cluing in. I'm really uh, honored just to be kind of over the uh, over the phone and computer with you all. Um, I'm sitting, yeah. and we have a, a, a tense-looking building on the campus of our church, New Life Church in Colorado Springs, and I have an office up there. Uh, and I'm sitting in that office, and I have a phone line here that's kind of on speaker, and I have my laptop open. Yeah. And uh, I have guitars everywhere, and I am uh, alone and enjoying it. Beautiful. Well, I'm sitting in my home office up in uh, Langley, BC, and I also have, uh, you know, I have a stack of guitars, and uh, my little fireplace is going, and and uh, I have a home office that's uh, kind of out in the countryside here with horses and and all that kind of stuff all around, but. It's so beautiful that we can do something like this, and you know we've got people from all over the world listening in. So we are like a, you know a worldwide thing going on right here, and uh, it's going to be great to to get to know all that to, has gone on in your life and and ministry, John. So why don't we kind of start you know on that note and uh, just kind of give us a sense of the the, the heart of the ministry. And the the band, it's kind of like, is it a band or is it a ministry? It's both. Give us a sense of, you know, what is this desperation band? What's the whole desperation thing? What are you desperate for? I appreciate Tell us that. about that. Yeah, absolutely. We started, uh, the desperation band formed out of a, a, a prayer gathering for young people mm-hmm. called Desperation. It was actually 10 years ago I... Uh, Graduated college, came to New Life Church to lead worship for the youth uh, on staff, and really just so blessed to be able to be a part of the local church and be able to do that. And uh, we started uh, brainstorming about prayer and about the need for to get young people praying, to get young people uh, mm-hmm. to, to a passionate pursuit of the things of God, to call them to this idea that there is a, a deep reality in the presence of God, and to call them to that, and. And uh, so we just started a gathering called Desperation with uh, some of our youth pastors, mainly uh, Pastor David Perkins. And, and uh, we uh, gathered, uh, we, we were doing it consistently with the young people of our local church here in our community, and then we wanted to invite anyone else who wanted to come, and we just did an event, basically. But it was a prayer and fasting event for three days. I mean, full-on worship and praying and fasting. And the, the, the best part about putting on an event where it's all fasting is you don't have to buy any food. So it was really cost. <laughs> it was really cost effective, but we yeah. saw literally. Um, I think it was something like seven or eight hundred young people from around the country came out to do this, which was bizarre. We were not known for anything. We were not, uh, you know, uh, popular or anything like that. So we, the band, we came together. We were leading worship at our church to basically just lead worship for this event, to, st- uh, to kind of set the table for what God wanted to do at this event. We had a friend who wanted to record the music because we started to write some original songs just to support what the Lord was saying and what the Lord was doing. And that kind of started everything for us. And we, that was our original kind of you know, core thing, and it hasn't changed. Our, 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 our core is our church at New Life Church, and this desperation now movement. It's been 10 years. We're talking about yeah. thousands on thousands of young people who have committed their lives to the Lord uh, in passionate and wonderful ways, in mission and action and justice. And, and uh, so we are still doing that strong. I think the music of the Desperation Band has grown in a way where it's not just aimed at young people, but, but we really do come alive in the multi-generational setting, the, the, really the, the, the whole yeah. church 
setting, which involves young people, involves uh, kids. Obviously, we have a conviction about young people, but we have a conviction about the church as well. So, you know, here yeah. we are years later, just so grateful for what the Lord has done. Did not seek out to be a band. Uh, we just wanted yeah. to provide worship for this thing, and that's what we're still doing. Yeah. I think it's beautiful, you know, when something comes out, like when you're not seeking after it, but it just truly comes out as a as kind of a genuine expression of what God wants to do, how he wants to work and magnify someone who's got the right heart, the right focus, and the right spirit. And I guess the challenge would be that once you do become known and, you know, popular, quote unquote, and you get some big publisher that wants to, you sure. know, put your albums all over the place, and then how do you retain that, that, uh, that kind of local church grassroots, you know, pure heart kind of focus? Well, I think, Ryan, so, uh, that, to spe- if I could speak to that, the greatest thing to combat that is the church, mm-hmm. is people right. that, that really, really know you. So they're not impressed by you. <laughs> they're people who really get you, who when the moment you yeah. even decide to start becoming impressed with yourself or you fall into a yeah. pit of temptation to try to please man, there's people there to show yeah. you compassion and love you and mother you and father you. And, and uh, that's the beauty of the yeah. whole church. You know, I'm seeing actually that come up as a theme more and more as I, I bump into some other artists. And uh, like last week, I was out in in uh, Dallas at a worship conference, and then we actually went to the Dove Awards at Atlanta as well. And, and a couple people, like Laura Story would be just an example of someone who, you know, such a great songwriter and worship leader, but, you know, her testimony is, I'm just glad that I can be in a situation where I can just be a worship leader in my church and that can be where this whole ministry flows out of that. Same with Paul Balash. You know, he is every other week in his church and, you know, I don't know how many people realize that he just leads worship for a little church of, you know, five to seven hundred people or something and uh, stays very connected and grounded. And and, uh, I, I remember once, you know, I was quite just kind of mesmerized, I think, when I went out to Austin, Texas and, you know, went to Chris Tomlin's church there. And here I see, you know, this Chris Tomlin character, you know, who I envision in front of tens of thousands of people, but even he is just leading worship in front of his 500 people. Uh, You know, guys like that that are just rooted in the church, um, you know, that's definitely where, where ministry stays real and uh, and grounded. So it's good to hear you coming from that. You know, yeah. speaking of the church, I, before we get into your album, I want to kind of start on a ground that of some songs and things that some of us are quite familiar with out of New Life Church has just come such tremendous music that has really gone, you know, all over the world and and impacted so many people. And I just think, you know, just a couple of songs like like I Am Free um, has just been massive, you know, in the last uh, uh, number of years. And when I say massive, I don't just mean, you know, wow, it's sold a lot and, you know, has been recorded and all of that. But, but it's truly become like a heart cry of people who just want to, you know, celebrate their freedom. Right. Some of them are singing that song when they're in the midst of, trauma and desperation and, you know, and, and trial, and they can sing that I am free. It's a declaration of faith and hope of, you know, this is God's will. This is God's, you know, this is what he has for me, and I'm going to live in it right now, regardless of my circumstance. Well, it's a, and, uh, just, it's a biblical, go ahead. It's a biblical certainty that we will have struggles. I mean, the, Jesus tells yeah. us. You know, that we will have struggles and troubles, and and it's a it's even you could say it's a reality. I mean, when people are sick, that's the re, that's their reality. When people are 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 consumed and chained up in fear and depression, that's a reality for them. And the greatest thing about worship to me is that we're able to declare the greater reality, a just a more superior reality and truth. Yeah. Uh, for instance, this song, "I Am Free." I, it was it was the fourth song that I'd ever written, and I was uh, it was years ago, and I was 
just had no idea that I was going to have a life of writing songs, and that wasn't kind yeah. of mission even. I just was daunted by it. I would love to do it, but I was daunted by it, and I had my own my struggle mm-hmm. with fear, uh, paralyzing fear and anxiety in my own life when the Lord revealed really? who he really is and the cross being enough. And he, it was a correct, he corrected my praying. He corrected my worship and it, from Lord yeah. set us free, Lord set me free to I have already. So just proclaim the truth. Proclaim what's already true, what was already paid for at the cross, which is you are already free. Say, say, proclaim yeah. that because it's already true whether you feel it or not. We just need to open our eyes and, and receive it. Yeah, um, yeah. But that was what it's done and how it's gone around the world and the testimonies that I continually still get from that song has been overwhelming to me because it was just a proclamation, yeah. something the Lord is doing in my life, and to see it impact others is so amazing. Yeah, beautiful. Well, and then the other song that's similar, and I'm not sure, did you write, were you a part of writing the Overcome song, or is that? Yeah, I, I, that, um, I did write Overcome, yes. You, you wrote that one as well. Uh, just, I mean, another similar type of theme of declaring what's real, you know, yeah. uh, kind of in spite of circumstance and, and as an expression of faith. And, and uh, John, I just, I personally, in, in, in my role in Praise Charts, I'm often watching to see, you know, what the church, and when I say the church, like churches worldwide, what they're singing and uh, themes and, you know, waves of songs that come and go. And, and I've just been watching this song in particular, Overcome, which has been out for a couple of years. But something has triggered in the last four to six months. Uh, in particular, Jeremy Camp had recorded it, uh, you know, probably a year ago or so. But uh, right now it's like, you know, right in the top realm of, songs that we are having go out from praise charts and I'm I'm like, wow, I'm gonna talk to the guy that you know, that bird that song. And I just wanna thank you, you know, on behalf of people that come to praise charts because I know there are hundreds out there that have taken that song and it's it's something that's really current and fresh right now. Like that overcome song is like a bubble that has just you know, come to the surface, and um, and I just want to thank you for writing that song. I know that song came out of, yeah. you know, a huge story, and uh, boy, we could spend the rest of the hour talking about that story, but just give us like two or three sure. minutes of, of that, and then we'll start going into your new stuff. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate what you're saying about the song. That's another song that's very special to me and um when it when you're realizing and watching it become special to others again it's really overwhelming um yeah yeah, we were as a church we were um walking through just the darkest uh time uh for us we had Mm. just a a horrible public uh, scandal with our pastor and something that blindsided us and it was very difficult to walk through and um and then not even a year later we had a, a young man disgruntled young man walked onto our church campus with uh, with ammunition and opened fire, and we lost two precious teenagers that day. Wow. All, and all this stuff happened within a year. And I'll tell you, you know, when Paul talks about rejoicing in your weakness, you know, it's a phenomenal thing when really, truly, we got to experience that when we are weak, he is strong, and when we are weak, his power is made perfect. And um, there was such a deep... Uh, we went to such a deep place in our suffering. Um, we were so desperate. We so just we were in need of the Lord, and uh, we had no idea what the, what, what the next day held. You know, the hope was it was was hard to to grasp, and and we were with our young people and talking about this idea that we are overcomers. We were going through Revelation, the Book of Revelation, to the church who overcomes, they will see this. To the church who overcomes, they will see this, and then Revelation twelve eleven. Um, They overcame him, talking about the evil one. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. Mm -hmm. And um, so we we started just spontaneously proclaiming, like we were talking about with I Am Free, proclaiming a greater truth, a greater reality, that we will overcome. The story, the end of the story has been written. We will not stay down. We will not stay on our, you know, on our face in defeat. We will 
overcome. And this idea was so erupting in our community because of obvious reasons that I knew that I wanted yeah. to develop a song out of it. And um, so I worked really quite hard on this this song. And um, you know, when we we started singing it as a church, it it was it was more than oh, it's a new song that John wrote. It was more than oh, it's the kind of a next song that these guys are a part of. It it became quickly something that everyone owned together. We all, all had right. a piece and we all wrote it together and we all we all were able to steward this song in a special way. And um, you know what? I'll tell you, as a worship leader at a, at a church, there's nothing greater. So again, the fact that it's gone outside of our church and touched the lives of others have been, has been awesome. But uh, yeah, it's quite a story, quite a journey we've been through. But uh, I'm telling you, I'm grateful for it. I wouldn't wish that yeah. type of thing on any church, but I would. Yeah wish the things that we learned on every church right right beautiful well perhaps some of that is what's going to come out now and you know as we talk through your your new album the center of it all and uh, and I had a chance to listen through you know a number of the songs and I always just love the I, I love the the style of music that comes out of your church because I feel like you know, it's it's not it's not on the edge of like you know heavy rock and roll or or you know traditional or because somehow it just sort of meets that place where I could grab into it, my son could and my mom could, and maybe that you know comes from your sense of that generational approach. But I really like the the music of it. And um, so why don't we just kind of start talking through. The, yep. the the song the center of it all which I'm you know showing here some of the lyrics for that but maybe you could talk about you know how that was the the central theme of the album and then let's talk about that song uh, how did it get written you know what's the story behind this yeah this song uh, it's a very special special song that it was written with some of my heroes so just the fact that I got to be a part of it was uh, really just kind of humbling and overwhelming but uh, the the guys who had started this song actually I came late in the game uh, I was having I was spending a few days writing with uh, a hero and now a good friend of mine Jason Ingram who uh, yeah. a phenomenal songwriter and I wanted to to yeah. connect with him because he's such a he's such a powerful writer and a powerful guy that and I was in a season where I wanted to grow I uh, was sensing that I was sensing that even the songs I had been working on I thought, you know what, these are all starting to sound like me, um, it, but but too much like me. Um, they need to sound more like the church. Like we were talking about Overcome, we need to all own this. And and this can't just yeah. sound like my vocabulary. This can't just sound like my style, my bent. It needs to sound more broad than that. And and uh, that was when the Lord really started lean, uh, leading me to more collaboration and getting with other writers. And uh, so anyway, I was able to get with Jason for a few days, which is so incredible. Um that uh, that we were able to carve out a f- carve out a few days, and I went down to Nashville, and and this is the first song we actually worked on. Uh, he had had this half the song written already with the the incredible Ben Fielding from Hillsong and Matt Redman. Yeah. And uh, you know he he <laughs> he said to me, we have this song, but we have not been able to finish it. It's been the the song that kind of we can't break it. You know, we can't unlock it, and uh, so I want to kind of show it to you. And I'm thinking to myself, if if the, if Jason Ingram, Ben Fielding, and Matt Redmond are having trouble finishing the song, there is no way I yeah. am going to jump in and yeah. uh, and do anything. I was immediately yeah. kind of uh, struck with this, uh, you know, gun shy situation yeah. in my in my mind. But I thought, well, you know what? Here we go. The Lord is is leading us to risk here, and here we go. And let's let's hear it. And I got to hear the song, and I immediately was struck by these lyrics of the verse. You know, I'm losing myself. And, all right, if I have you and nothing else, I have everything. If I have everything but you, I have nothing. And I'm letting go, letting go. And uh, I had been burning with this this theme that God is the center of it all. I had been praying often while leading worship that, you know, we, we're often telling our congregations or our youth groups, you know, God is number one on our list. And I'm thinking, man, that is too, that's too small for God. He's not on a list. He's not even number one on a list. He he is the list. He defines yeah. every piece of the list. And I was thinking, he's he's the center of all things. We don't make him that. He is that. And I was had this idea of, you're the center of it all. I was just burning with it for weeks. 
And I, so I immediately thought of that while listening to the verses of this song. And I, so I grabbed the guitar and with Jason, I said, well, I have, a, I have an idea, a direction to take it in. And uh, this idea has been burning in me. And so I, we started singing through it. And uh, it was one of those choruses that came quick, and, uh, which is awesome. Because most of the, uh, actually, most of the song was written other than that. And uh, we had spent about an hour and a half, two hours crafting this chorus. You're the center of it all. You're the savior of my soul. You are the source of life. How could I not cry? Lord, you are the hope of greatest price. Jesus alone be lifted high. You are the source of life. You're the center of it all. And uh, this is the type of worship that I love, proclamations of a greater reality like we've already been talking about. You are the center of it all. Not we make you the center of it all. Mm -hmm. You are these things. And it puts... God, where He belongs, and I think here's mm-hmm. here's love. Well, here's why we themed the album center of it all. Um, we look around, and 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 most every issue of the of the human of human nature comes down to self absorption, uh, our fears, our right. anxieties, our our need for approval, our 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 shame and condemnation. It's its this inward focus. And I think I've been seeing so much of it. I mean, belonging to a church, you're just rubbing shoulders with people all the time. And what you see, what I've been seeing so often is this this idea of what about me? One's my turn. One's this. What about I this? I'm dealing with this. And all this me, me, me. And uh, it's very tempting for all of us. its I think we're born into it. Uh, to look at self, and it's this war against our souls that that continually happens daily, and it's something that we need to rise up against daily. And I think the greatest tool we have to correct this type of thinking is worship, and right. it, it is the greatest corrective to to take eyes off of self as being the center of anything, and put yeah. them and fix them, them on Him who is the center of everything, and that changes. Yeah. That changes our soul. That changes our mind and our heart when we fix our eyes right. on something else. And worship is a selfless act. So we stop being selfish. We stop being self-absorbed. And we absorb ourselves in the King. We absorb ourselves in Jesus, in his presence. And we sing to him. And we love on him. And we fix our eyes on him. Next thing you know, we're fixing our eyes on the things that he's fixing his eyes on, which is yeah. the poor or the, our neighbor or our family, you know. And next thing you know, we're living differently. And I think worship starts it all. And it's just that's why I love worship so much. And I think it's why God's using it so much. It's a good reminder of like the tremendous responsibility put on you when you're writing songs like this. You're giving voice that is, you know, it's really shaping people's theology, their understanding of God, and expression of it. And I think, you know, some people have have criticized worship in the last 20 to 30 years, you know, all we're doing is singing songs or, you know, about me and, you know, right. what I'm feeling and all of that. And and it's great that you are kind of standing up through that and just making a mark on the church to go, you know, we are not at the center. And yes, I might be feeling something right now, but that's not at the center. Jesus is at the center. So um, that's right. It's seek uh, first. You know? Seek first yep. the kingdom of God, not seek first my own. Mm-hmm. You know, my own stuff, my own blessings, my own curses, my own. It's seek first the kingdom, and I think you f- focus on yeah. heaven. You, you get, you know, Timothy Keller is one of my favorite uh, spe- uh, speakers. Yeah. Pre- he he always says, focus on heaven, you get earth thrown in. Focus on earth, you get nothing. Right. And, Right. I think that's what this is with worship. Let's focus on the greater. Let's focus on the more superior. Yeah. And I, you know, there is rising worship movements even that that are singing about us and singing about self. Yeah. And I think yeah. the Lord, you know, the Lord is saying, hey, hey, let's you know, fix your eyes on yeah. me. I'm the author. I'm the perfecter. Yeah. Well, what a privilege you had to write this song with. I mean, these are great world class. <laughs> yeah songwriters who, you know, have a, a massive influence on, on the church. And and uh, Jason is one. I see his name come up all over the place, but he's never the artist. He's always the co-writer with everyone, sure. right? <laughs> he's like this floating, you know, he's, you know, he'll go out and bring the best out of anyone, you know, from passion to you guys to, I, I don't know, just everywhere. And, and uh, I... 
I'm just impressed with him. And then, of course, you know, Ben Fielding is is writes such great stuff out of Hillsong, and and I'm glad to see that you know those Hillsong guys are getting outside of Hillsong Church and interacting and engaging in in the community of worship leaders around the world. I see Reuben Morgan coming up a lot, you know, in various songs around, and and uh, you guys get to experience something pretty awesome in in your world of uh, songwriters, you know, a great responsibility, but when it all comes out, then, you know, it has a great impact on people. If I, Let's I mean, move into this. Can, I, Go can ahead. I comment real quick on something you just said? Um, the, yeah. This, I do believe that there's, it's a spiritual issue that writers need to be getting with other writers. Um, I yeah. think the Lord is using worship music in such a strong and powerful way, and I think the day that songs are maybe leading back to an individual, that that day is over and in such a unique yeah. way. The Lord is, is using community and uh, like a song like yeah. Central Ball, it points back to, f- uh, there's four different locations, four different churches, four different ideas, four different people. That's phenomenal. I think yeah. that's really tremendous and it speaks to the, the, the breadth and the width of the church and the kingdom of God. Yeah. And uh, so I think there's something really unique happening with collaboration with writers and the challenge to non-writers is that this idea that we truly do need each other. It's not weakness to rely on us. It's actually strength to rely on us. It's weakness to be prideful and to say that I could do this on my own. That's not the way God set it up. He set us up to be used by... He set it up so He uses us. He uses people to be His hands and feet. And we need to be there for each other. And that is the way the Lord has set it up. So this process of collaborating on this album with so many people has been an awakening for me. I absolutely yeah. love it. I think it's the fruit of it has oh. been deep, deeper uh, songs and songs that serve the church in a greater way even. So anyway, yeah. I just wanted to put in there. Good, good stuff. Well, let's talk about this song, Strong God. And, you know, I'll just say when I was listening to this, I thought, oh, this is this is totally my style. I love the, you know, the slower song, but uh, like with the way you got the strings coming out, just a real sense of, of God's presence, such a singable uh, melody, and I love the, the theme that comes out of, you know, this is God in his holy place, yeah. and uh, just describing that holy place, uh, you know, being the father to the fatherless, defender of the weak, freedom for the prisoners we sing, and, and that's where God resides. It's his temple in uh, in those people, in the weak, in the fatherless, in the prisoners. And um, I just want to say before we start talking about the background of this song is we actually are offering the, the MP3 of this song and the chord chart are downloadable right now for free. So if any of you want to just go and sort of take that in after the webinar, that'll be available all week. But, um, you know, it we would love to see this song just, you know, go viral all around and uh, let people soak it in. You can just listen to it, worship with it yourself, or, or share it with your church. But um, tell us about, you know, how this song came about, who are some of the people involved in writing it, yeah. and um, what's the background? This is uh, this was the last addition to the album. Um, we were actually wrapping up production on all the songs, and we had not had the song uh, on it. And uh, I was in Nashville writing, and uh, I had started this song. And, um, you know, with, you know, as a writer at this point, um, doing this as much as I can for the last 10 years, there's moments where you really feel like you've landed on something unique in a song. And... Um, when I started this song, I knew that that was that was the case, and um, it 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 all started with you know from Psalm 68. It's, if you just read, if you just kind of spend, I would encourage everyone to spend a, a month in Psalm 68. It's just it's already mm-hmm. a phenomenal song in it of itself, and it starts describing who God is and the you know father to the fatherless, defender of the widows, you know. Uh, leading lo- the lonely into families, um, the, what marches us in, through the wilderness, and 
And it says, this is God in his holy dwelling. This is God, another translation. This is God in his holy habitation. And then uh, another translation that I took from, this is God in his holy place. And again, uh, not to keep harping on it, but I love to declare who God is. Right. I don't think that we find who we are until we know who he is. And that, to say these, to have these declarative statements, this is, this is God in his holy place. It really sets it up. This is, you know, let's define the God that we're worshiping here. Let's talk about him. Let's, let's yeah. sing, to, let's sing to him about him. Um, so, yeah. um, so anyway, we, and, and it's very special to me because the Lord has done some tremendous things with our church and in my own heart with the idea of the fatherless, the widow, the, the less fortunate, the poor. I've seen so much freedom come into my own life as I've, I've as I've uh, worked to be a blessing to, to the to the widow to the to the orphan and been on some 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 great trips over overseas and the Haiti and some different places where we've gotten to come face yeah. to face with poverty and face to face with the different things that are happening right here right now on the earth and this conviction that the Lord has put hope and freedom in our hands so we could deliver it to others and I um so I immediately wanted to write about this, that, that this is who God is. He's the father to, to the orphan. You know, he defends the weak. Yeah. So, and then the psalm just continues. I think it's in 30, verse 32 and in different places in the psalm. It's just, it, it's a command to sing to God. Kingdoms of the earth sing praise to the Lord. And, and there's a moment in the psalm that, that calls him a strong, he's a strong God. And uh, I just was so struck by it. And uh, so, yeah, I, you know, in, in, in kind of in spirit with the idea that I, I want to collaborate and I want to bring other people into this. And I felt like I had a, there was a, something special on this idea and on this song. I wanted to be sure to steward that well, and I thought that a great way to steward that well would be to bring in other people. I was in um, Nashville writing with a very good friend, Meredith Andrews, who's another great artist and phenomenal yeah phenomenal person we've done yeah. we've done uh, some dates and some touring with her and loves the lord and has a heart actually i actually met uh meredith uh, on a trip to haiti we actually met mm. uh, at an orphanage as we were there uh playing guitar and, and hanging out with uh with about 30 kids that were just crawling all over us and we were just having a blast mm. so the lord knit our hearts together for the fatherless uh because we were doing that together but uh we dug into the scriptures. We dug into Psalm 68 mainly, and we started fleshing out more lyrics for this song. And I invited, so I invited her into this process. And then it was two days later. I was still there, and I was with Jason for a couple hours. And I showed it to him. I said, "I want to. This is something special, and I would love to love to um, continue to flesh it out with you." And we wrote the bridge together, which uh, which to get back to it, it's just another great, great uh, declaration. There's no higher. There's no greater. There's none stronger. Right. And um, right. I love the the bridge and the ascending melody that says no. So no, I love that. I love the church kind of making kind of let's be prophets here for a moment. Let's just say no. There's no higher. Yeah. Oh, no, you know. And uh, yeah. so you know, um, it. So we we were so excited right away about the song. I went to I had coffee with Paul Mabry who produced the project. Who is just uh, I can't say enough about Paul and enough thanks. An appreciation to Paul to take us under his wing and to kind of mess with us and mold us, shape us and push us and stretch us and it was make us super uncomfortable and make us rejoice and and we need that again another testament just to the need for other people but um, he uh, and I had coffee I showed the song to him and uh, he was struck by it immediately and I, we need to throw this onto the uh, project and I know we're late in the game here but let's be quick let's just figure it out and he took it on I said all right let's do it you know I flew back two weeks later and we took about a day and a half and we we uh fleshed out this song and uh it's funny how that works it ends up becoming one of the favorites yeah. yeah don't worship leaders tend to do things kind of last minute anyways isn't that like one of the <laughs> maybe maybe we the pressure all the pressures yeah. on ourselves the pressure comes off we find out really who we are and we start yeah. thinking really I know. <laughs> Sometimes the, the best, most creative things come, you know, when there's that pressure at the end and and it's Saturday night and it's like, oh, I've got to do this Sunday morning. It's just the yeah. problem when, is when, when the senior pastor gets, you know, inspired like that and then he sends word to the worship leader saying, the, the message has changed tomorrow and I need you to change all your songs and, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. 
But worship leaders, we can be inspired anytime. Yeah. Well, so, no, I you. think it's great. <laughs> So thank yeah. You. Yeah. So let's uh, well let's keep going. Uh, I know we're not going to be able to spend all this time on on you know all the songs, um, but uh, you're giving us a good flavor of at least the tone of the album, and and uh, and obviously a theme is coming through of of just declaring you know what is right and what is true, and uh, and making those kind of faith theological proclamations, giving a voice to the church. Yeah. Um, I love personally the whole imagery of the river, and that's why I, wa- I really wanted to get to this song. Um, I just happened to spend a little bit of time last week with Michael Neal. Do you know Michael Neal? He's also an integrity, and you do know him. I do yes. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if you know what he's been involved in in the last um, I don't know six months or so. He he just wrote a book called The River, and has turned it into a whole multimedia experience, At uh, and you can find out about it at theriverexperience.com. So I was actually having lunch you know, beside him, and he passed me his book and kind of told me about this whole you know, vision that he has of, of so much uh, symbolism of, of the river. Yeah. And uh, anyways, I'm not making this into an advertisement on him. You know, other than to say that it's just a beautiful picture, and uh, so I'd love to hear. You know, wh- what is your, uh, where did this come from, and and uh, tell me about the river from New Life Worship and and the desperation band. Like, yeah, the, the this is the most uh, I think this is the most significant song for me that I've ever written, and I I, I don't uh, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be dramatic. Uh, over you know you know romanticize the song, um, but I found the Lord in a time uh, I was in high school, and I met the Lord in a, a season that our church was going through where you know you can people named it something you know it was years ago where people talked about the renewal movement and uh, I don't you know that's fine to name it something but I, I what we were seeing tremendous things happen in our church and one of the things one of the byproducts of the refreshing that the Lord is bringing to his people and the renewal was was these meetings that would go hours and times of soaking in the presence of the Lord, times of, of listening to his voice, times of really sitting on passages of scripture, um, just kind of unhurried, uninterrupted time with God. And um, mm. that's how I found the Lord. That's what Christianity, that's kind of the, my walk with, with the Lord and faith began in that season of our church. And one of the passages of scripture that was def- very, uh, def- defined the time was from Ezekiel 47. Another, another place that people should just sit on for a month is, is spend some time in Ezekiel 47. And it's this prophetic picture um, of Ezekiel. Um, being kind of all of a sudden he's in the new Jerusalem, you know, when all is made right in, in the earth and all is in Christ is fully reigning and we are reigning with him. Out of the temple is a river, and it and it flow, you know, this river flows down to the Dead Sea, and this river brings life wherever it goes. And the pro- prophet Ezekiel in the passage is being taken to this river, and he's being led, and all of a sudden he's kind of finds that he's ankle deep in the river he's he's then knee deep and and all of a sudden it, beca- it becomes a message about control you know if you've ever stood in you know I've done some some white water you know rafting and if you know these rivers yeah. got quite a pace and if you're you know you're ankle deep you know you you are still firmly planted on the earth and you're still fully in control, but you have a sense of that river. And I think that's a lot where we live. You know, we still want our control. We still want to be able to, to wrap our heads around everything, but we want some of the Lord. So we have this ankle deep situation. And then if we want to maybe go deeper in the Lord, but we don't want to lose control, we do the knee deep thing. And well, you know, all of a sudden we're, it's causing us to sway a little bit. And then the, if you keep reading in the passage, it's a waist deep uh, experience. But then the moment that I long for as a believer and uh, as a worshiper happens to Ezekiel where he's completely submerged and uh, immersed in the river and he's totally, sw- completely swept away. There's no more control. 
There's no more being able to kind of take care of every situation. There is just, I'm sw- he's swept away in this river. But the thing about this river is when it describes it in Ezekiel, it's the river that brings life wherever it goes. And it's a call. It's a, it's a prophetic picture to all of us as worshipers to be pulled off of the shore of control and to immerse mm-hmm. ourselves in the river where it is scary, where it is unpredictable, where we're not sure where right. we're going, but there is a trust in our God that it's bringing us life. And it's just, I think it's a phenomenal picture. It is something that's impacted me all of my life ever since I found the Lord till now. So it's been a song, really, that I've been wanting to write for at least 20 years. And, a, and mm-hmm. an idea an idea that I wanted to flesh out, but it seemed too special and too weighty for me to figure out how to craft it into a song. And uh, somehow, some way, this is, it kind of, you know, we got the, re- I got the kind of the release to start on this thing and go for it. And I um, uh, invited in Mia Fields uh, from, she's from originally mm-hmm. Hillsong, she's living in Nashville now. She's become a dear friend to us as well. Phenomenal lyricist. Mm-hmm. And I brought her this the mm-hmm. message this song and I had the I had a lot of it fleshed out and we just got to work on lyrics we got to, we just spent time sweated through and just got to work on lyrics and then Paul Mayberry got involved with the feel of the music and we wanted to make it feel a bit hit, like a hymn um, because you know I think great songs are songs that are always true they're timeless they're you know they don't have a this is just true of today it's just they're always true you could have sung it a hundred years ago you could sing it a hundred years from now and the song will always be true and this river song is this is something i wanted to make sure of this needs i want it to sound like it's always true and i obviously wanted to say the words that are always true and uh so it's a call to our church you know at the chorus is real special it says take me to the river pull me off the shore here within your freedom i have found my reason i am yours let the, waters, let the water rise far above my head. Baptize me in wonder. Spirit, take me under once again. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is a death to life idea. This is, you know, let our dry bones, you know, just ten chapters earlier, there's an army of dry bones that come to life, and here we are ten chapters later in Ezekiel 47, <clears throat> talking about life, coming to life. And uh, this is a worship song, a prayer to God, to pull us off the shore, but it's also a call to believers. I I pray and hope that as people hear this song, and we've already gotten great testimonies flooding through. The album's only been available for two weeks, and people hearing the call to jump off the shore, to let go of the control of, of, you know, that, that, you you know, a bit of an illusion anyway that we're in control of anything, (laughs) but to, but we really cling, don't we? We really do cling tightly to it. Um, but this is a call to jump in and to be swept away in it and to just trust that where this river is going will bring us life. So it's it's very, very special. I love singing it. We've been doing it live now for a few weeks, and oh, my goodness. It's, uh, yeah. it's a very unique uh, song to, to me and to, and to us. So I'm very, very grateful for it. And I think it's fitting to close out the album with this song, it actually it actually goes from this song into a, the bri- another bridge section of the song, which is just a, a declarative prayer to let it flow, let the river flow. It's for our churches, it's for our families, it's for our mm-hmm. lives. But there is life that the Lord is offering us, but we must decide to let go. Yeah, Amen. Well, another great you know voice of worship for the church and. Uh, so, okay, so that's like three songs that we've gotten through. And, man, every time I bring up a song, you just go on and on and on. You've got all this heart and story that comes out of each one. I had a few more that I wanted to talk through, but I, I do want to give a chance for some of the people who are listening in to ask you a few things. So do you mind if we kind of go into that just to sort of personalize this for, for people and we'll sort of step away from the actual album? And just a reminder that, you know, any of you who are listening, you can go to praystarts.com forward slash listening party and, and find the Desperation Band listening party, which basically has all the songs from the album, full audio that you can stream and listen to and make comments. And, and uh, we've got a couple of free charts and other uh, resources on this 
album. So we'd love to have you know people just start engaging with this album and and uh, you know so much more meaningful when you start to hear the stories and, and the heart behind it. Um, John, just you know, in talking to you, I get a good sense that you are the real thing and uh, the real deal. Uh, your your heart's in the right place, and and uh, I just want to you know affirm you in that place. So um, so I'm just going to start asking you know, kind of going through a list of a few things here. I've got yeah. the first question that came in is from Justin, and he wants to know about how you guys do your worship uh, practices in your church just with your large, larger ministry. So I'm just going to read his question more specifically. He says, how does New Life with a large team, assumably, conduct rehearsals? Are they weekly or early on Sundays? He says, we have a growing team and weekly rehearsals are becoming impractical. So how do you make it work on a weekly basis, John? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, our, here's the thing. We're trying to build culture. We're trying to build unity. We're trying to build team and family because we think that out of that overflow of family and unity and team would be uh, is the most effective worship leading. And uh, so we are very particular about this. Um, we don't like to just, just gather the Sunday morning early to kind of run through what we're doing. We like to gather beforehand. So we on Thursday evenings, we do, because we do have a larger team, we, have, do, we do have a rotation system. Um, the Thursday before the Sunday, we will gather with the band, and we'll, oh, like, uh, just this Thursday night, I'll be leading a rehearsal, because um, I'm leading uh, worship this Sunday at our church. And uh, so I'll share a quick word from, um, you know, from the scriptures, and just encourage us, and, and you know, kind of bring some direction spiritually to where uh, we believe the Lord wants to take us on Sunday morning. And then we dive into the songs, and we think of creative things, and we, you know, anyone's open to say, what about this? What if we try this? And we flesh it out. And then when we arrive on Sunday mornings, we still arrive some, uh, early to kind of line check and just to be together. But by the time we show up Sunday mornings, there's a camaraderie, there's a unity, there's an understanding of what we're doing. Yeah. So we, we do that. That's Thursday evenings before the Sunday. And then Sunday morning... You guys, do you, do you have a, another like full practice? Then? It's about a 20 minute, or? 20 minute run through, just to make sure that we're feeling okay, that the technical needs yeah. are met, and the sound is good, and that we just kind of warm up, and then uh, then we'll kind of grab a yeah. coffee, pray together, share you know share another word with the because the choir is there. We have a choir that kind of hangs with us at that point, and so we'll come together and pray, and and then we're off we're off to the races. Yeah. I like that focus that, you know, really it's all about trying to build that sense of camaraderie and community in that week. That's the opportunity you have from worship practice to Sunday morning. It's, it's not about just showing up. We're the, we're the, you know, we're the token band for the, yeah. for the show because that's not what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's one community expressing to another community and, you know, kind of joining together like that. So, so that's what comes through, hey. And it, and it, it says too that the, the you know these musicians that their deepest and greatest value to us is not their craft, but their deepest and greatest value to us is them as people and the relationships that we have with them. The only way to show that is to spend time with them. Yeah. Okay. Well, another question here from Joel it says, how do you balance wanting the music in worship to be great without the music becoming the focus over worship? He says it seems to be a a fine line sometimes. Yeah, I you think get the, the heart of that question. It's a great question. I think the answer starts to become clear when you when you're spending consistent time with your congregation because I think there's been moments where we'll start to push musically because we want to push and we want to be creative and we're called to be creative. But next thing you know you're losing people and the question becomes it's the question is not anymore what's wrong with these people? It's really what's wrong with us that we're not serving these people. And we are here we're pastors first. That's the thing. We're musicians second. And and uh, if we do anything that compromises our role as pastors, then we need to, to step back. And if it's our music that's actually compromising the role, our role as pastors, then we need to relook at things. But I think for us, every church is different. There's, there's kind of a threshold for our church where if we push too hard musically, we end up losing them. They end up watching. Um, and we're not. We're, we're actually. We're called to to to. We're called to call out worshipers to engage, not to watch. Yeah. Not to, and uh, 
So it's, it becomes clear, and we were able to debrief that later and say, you know what, we, we're losing kind of the purpose there. So we could, let's make sure we're making music that serves the people. Beautiful. Um, Paul says, I'd like to hear about Magnified. So Paul, I'm going to acquiesce to you and, uh, and say, we'll go back to one of the songs I had in the list. And yeah. I must confess, I'm, I'm not as familiar with this song, but some of the people who have been listening, you know, obviously know this song. And why don't you tell us what's the story of it and how it came about? Give us some background to that song. Uh, this is, uh, we've been, you know, we've been doing this song very consistently at our church. It's uh, this, Strong God. There's multiple songs in the album that just seem to fit like a glove into church settings. And that's uh, yeah. nothing that is sweeter for me to watch and be a part of. But uh, we've been singing this one for weeks at our church, just every week. And I believe I'm doing it again this Sunday. But we just love it very much. But I wrote this with uh, with Paul Mabry and Jason Ingram. And uh, it really started, the song started in a way that that rarely, rarely happens. Uh, Jason was just right, kind of, you know, vamping on an acoustic guitar, this kind of verse cadence. And, uh, you know, rarely do I sit down with a guitar and just start to try to create something. I always, I often just start with a theme. Here's what I want to write about. Here's kind of where we're going. Here's some scriptural reference, and it really gives us a place to start. But this one started just from nothing. It started completely just cold, and here's some musical stuff. And it was, it ended up being this, me and Paul and Jason in a room for about eight, nine hours, just starting to throw lyrics into the scene and try to find a theme and find kind of a stream to go with with this thing. And once the word magnified was thrown into the mix, it changed everything. And uh, this idea of magnified, uh, you know, we were talking about how it, it, people say, well, that's to make something bigger. And the truth of it is to magnify something is not to make it bigger. Yes, it becomes bigger in our vision, but it's really to look at it as it really is. If you look, you know, I'm a Discovery Channel addict. I love that. Yeah. They do these things where they'll kind of do this microscopic image of something, and it's something that you would see normally and think this of it. But when you get up close, there's detail. There's this tremendous creation to it. And... This is, we want to look at Christ for who he is. We want to look at Jesus. We want him to be larger, yes, but really we want to see the details. And this is us saying that's what we want to see. Jesus, we magnify you. We want the world to see you for who you really are. Be magnified. Be made clear to us, to yeah. others. And uh, so that's how it all went. And then, you know, in, in, in the book of uh, Second Kings, the, the greatest heavens, they cannot contain you. And we were just struck by this idea that the, that the heavens cannot contain him, cannot contain the Savior, the love of Jesus. And so it became instantly uh, a beautiful proclamation, again, of just of saying, who Je- you know, this is Jesus. He's the wonder of the world. And there's something, too, that we want to be clear on as worshipers. What differentiates us from from other belief systems or uh, religions is Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. So we want, as worship leaders and songwriters, we want to be clear about Jesus. So I love yeah. Jesus, wonder of the world. We love you. And the Savior, again, who is Jesus? He's our Savior. And let's just be even more clear. Son of God, we magnify you. And so it was, it's, it's to, to be clear, if we're filling uh, the, our congregation's mouths with the truth of the Lord, let's make sure that they are the truths of the Lord. And uh, so it's a, we love the song. It's very congregational, and we've been really, really enjoying uh, singing it. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, probably enough time for one or two more questions. Now, this one's getting a little more personal, but, uh, you know, people want to hear kind of behind the shell when they're they're asking some questions. So this person is, I'm just trying to find the name, but they're asking, what have you found as a worship leader specifically has been most challenging for you? Do you think you could, does something come to mind as you think about the scope of your ministry and the nature of being a worship pastor, recording artist, all the various elements? What yeah. is the challenge? Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's a great question. I think uh, immediately I hear that question and I think, what, are, what have been my greatest frustrations, you know, yeah. as a worship leader? And I think um, it is this, 
I love Jesus, you know, I love the Lord, and I so deeply want others to see him in a way that I, maybe I'm seeing him. And when I'm leading worship and I see maybe a room of people or, or individuals that don't quite aren't quite engaging with that idea or really caring to or wanting to, I don't get frustrated or mad at them, but my, my heart does grieve, and it is a challenge mm-hmm. I think of think of the woman, uh, the Mary, the breaking open the, the expensive perfume over Jesus, right? The the alabaster jar of perfume, and it really cost her something. I think sometimes, you know, I, we want to be Marys, you know, we want to make sure that we're giving God something that costs us. And I, I sometimes, but then Mary, if you if you read that that passage in the Gospels, there's people in the room that are actually criticizing what she's doing. There are people in the room that are actually saying, why why this waste? Why do it this way? Why do it that way? And Jesus brings discipline and says, what she has done to me is beautiful. And wherever the gospel is preached, what this woman, her worship will be talked about. So I feel confident in my extravagant offering, but I feel grieved and challenged and, 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 and discouraged when there are people in the room that are actually bringing criticism to it and actually going, why this way or why that way? And, and mm-hmm. thus missing the point. And uh, it motivates me to keep going for sure, but it's hard. And I think that would be... I bet you I bet you a lot of people listening in, you know, experience, because I just know in my own life, you know, how hard it is when I'm leading worship and to look into people's eyes and just be like, how can you just stand there with your hands in your pockets, you know, like... Uh. And uh, it, it feels... Because as artists, we're... we're um, very sensitive, you know, I'm assuming, you know, many of us listening and perhaps you as well, John, you're like, you're sensitive and you just, the nature of your spirit and, and thinking like, you know, is it me? (laughs) We have to sort of work through the whole personal thing of like, am I not serving people like they need to? Am I not connecting with them? And like, how do you sort through that? Is this about them and God? Or is it about me and my ability to, you know, be effective? Uh, is there something broken in me that I need to fix that these people are not responding to? I mean, just a myriad of questions goes on while you're singing and playing. Uh, that's how it is for me anyways. I can have, you know, ten thoughts going through my head at all at the same time, and it's just my reality. Yeah, is that no, for I... You I too? You know, to be, you know, you know, the the man pleasing thing, the people pleasing thing is, uh, man, I'll tell you, it's it's a it's a war that just rages, and uh, I wish I could say that it goes away, and uh, you know, this would be right up there with challenges, um, and just yeah. stuff hard to deal with, but uh, this idea that man is looking to to you, but also looking at you and drawing conclusions yeah. about you, and uh, it's it's something that you have to constantly die to and slay this this need for man's approval and this need for to be liked uh i mean it, it's it is it's a war that that is raging yeah. i mean i i sit here on this i'm talking to a phone and i'm i'm picturing people are listening in and, and i know that people are even listening to my voice and drawing conclusions about what i'm saying and, and maybe even yeah you should see what they're writing about you in the chat window man yeah, well, you know, I mean, part of me doesn't even want to look, you know. <laughs> you yeah. never know. You just never know what's out there. And, uh, you know, I it's something that I will continually try to slay that beast of, of, of yeah. needing or wanting or drawing strength from man's approval. You know, Jesus is my master and no other, and mm-hmm. I want him to be pleased with me. And... Um, but to live that is is takes discipline. Yeah, beautiful. Well, you know what? We are at ten fifty nine, and the hour has slipped away. And uh, John, I just want to end by you know thanking you. I thank you for being God's you know minister and a voice that is first to your own church, and uh, and by God's grace, He's allowed that voice to extend around the world. And uh, it's just a privilege for us, you know, from Praise Chart to join with you guys in, in helping spread out 
you know, the word of your, your music, creating resources for it, and, uh, and, and resourcing churches. So, you know, together we're, uh, it's just a great, great honor. And uh, it's nice to know that this music comes from a pure and great, you know, and, and broken and, and healed and free and overcome place, right? All those words. And uh, I just want to encourage you in your ministry like that. And so as we kind of wrap up here, I want to say that something happened uh, three or four weeks ago when we were doing this with Paul Balash. At the end, we ended the, the webinar, and then people sort of stuck around in the chat room, and they wanted to just chat with Paul a little bit. And John, if you would have maybe 10 minutes or so and uh, bear to open up into that you know, chat world. Maybe a few people want to just say a few words to you or, or whatever, and you can type right back to them. And we'll officially close off our, our webinar here, but sometimes it's kind of like the fun little, uh, you know, let's get in a little group with John and, and just sure. have a, a few minutes with him. So, so John is available there, and um, I just want to thank you for your ministry. And uh, many people have been listening in live. Others will come. This will be recorded and uh, put on our, our website and connected to all these songs. Go to the listening party that's on the site. Listen and, and uh, share these songs around your various Facebook, Twitter, email, all the different ways you can tell people, and, and let's just bless this church was blessing us. So, Thank you, John. Thank and, you, Ryan. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up. You're very welcome. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. I am not going to stop the, the, uh, the webinar, but I'm just going to close down the meeting and stop the recording. And, uh, and you're welcome to chat with John for a few minutes uh, afterwards. God bless you all. Thanks very much. Thank you.